got some, some notes. So real quick, um, if you guys want to introduce yourselves and your business, just a quick one or two liner before we get into the questions. Uh, I'm Matt Gray. Uh, Neighborhood Produce is the name of the business. Um, it's a small footprint produce-based grocery store. Uh, we're still looking for the right physical location. I have a couple in mind, um, but doing pop-ups in the meantime. The first one is this weekend at the Winter Hill Brewery. I'm Katrina Jazieri, um, one of the owners of Juliet. Uh, we opened in the former Sherman space um, a little over five months ago now, and um, we're breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, my partner Josh and I are, uh, live in Somerville, right here in Union Square, um, so we'll get into more of the uh, reasons why the Kickstarter platform was really great for us, but um, we've been successfully operating for five months and um, just got a little bit of national press, so I'm, I'm excited to share that um, as well. So glad to be here and looking forward to talking with you. Cool. I'm glad you pronounced your last name for us because I was going to botch that. That's why I just said Katrina. Um, it's cool. You guys, uh, um, outside from crowdfunding, it seems like pop-ups are definitely uh, an MO and part of your strategy. So I definitely want to make sure to hit on that as well. Um, so you both, both use Kickstarter as your platform of choice for crowdfunding. Um, can you tell people a little bit more why you chose Kickstarter as opposed to Indiegogo? and some others, and um, you know, was it a really um, hard decision, like, or was it like, no, Kickstarter is, is the one? Yeah, so um, it, was, it was kind of a hard decision because there were a lot of different, there's a lot of different platforms out there that you can use now. Uh, a few years ago it was really Kickstarter was it, and now, like I said, there's Indiegogo. Um, there's, there's a lot of them out there. Um, I think I went with Kickstarter mostly because of the, really two things, the name recognition and being able to set that goal. I feel like it, it puts more drive behind it. You know, you have 30 days, if you don't hit it, you don't get anything. And it kind of, it, it makes you both as the person launching the campaign, it puts the clock on it. So you're really like working hard to make sure that it, that it works out. And I think also from people funding it, it makes, maybe you seem a little bit more serious about it. Um, a little bit more like a real project that's going to be able to get off the ground. Um, for us, it was, I think, um, early stages, we sort of, uh, we found out that the space was available and didn't want to sort of lose, lose any time. And so we didn't agonize over what mm -hmm. platform to use. We said, well, we both know Kickstarter. Let's do a Kickstarter. Um, and Josh maybe did more research than I did on that, but I think it was more, like you said, name recognition. You don't have to explain what it is. Um, and then also, you know, we had been familiar with some of our friends in the restaurant industry also using Kickstarter, so we knew that that was a platform that would be recognizable for that type of product or service um, rather than, you know, funding a person to do a specific task or event or something like that. Um, so that was important. I think the deadline is a really good point um, because it will get to this later in the questions, but um, it can be a never ending kind of, mm -hmm. you know, you can always email more people or, you know, promote it in a different way. But having, um, especially for us when we didn't really have anything to, it wasn't one product that we were selling. It was a promise of an experience in the future or um, a piece of the community. So being able to have um, sort of specific events based around that, um, which is one of the strategies that we um, implemented, but saying, you know, for this month only, we're doing this. Um, don't wait too long to get on board or come and talk to us. Um, so I think that was, I don't honestly know if other platforms um, have deadlines either, but um, we liked, we liked the um, truly like crowd part of it. Like if we don't get there all together, then it doesn't happen, which I think we sort of, we um, counted on a lot that sort of hope of community or 
you know, yeah, let's get on board. Like, I want coffee on this corner again. Mm. Um, so I think that was, it was a good fit for us. Um, but that being said, I didn't have a ton of research or nothing to compare it to. This was our first, um, our first crowdfunding experience. So. And you, um, believe you, saw, Julie, you guys had the access to the space before launching Kickstarter, and I don't know if anyone saw they, you guys um, showed your progress with the whole business, and part of it was your Kickstarter. I thought that was an interesting way to loop in the community. Yeah, the so crowd. we were, I mean, we were lucky in that way, lucky and also uh, stress-inducing. We signed a lease before we had fully funded the restaurant, um, and we had, you know, we had enough, um, sort of enough commitments to say, something's gonna happen here. Um, if we can raise this money and if we can, you know, if these other pieces of funding come through, then we can do X, Y, and Z on top of that. Um, but there was a little bit of a risk there, like, okay, we're paying rent now, hmm. um, time, to, time to get serious and, and really line these things up. Um, but it gave us the ability to stand in front of the store, to film inside of it for our video, to say, this is what's gonna be right here, and in this corner you'll do that. And um, during the farmer's market Saturdays, we would stand outside, um, Josh and I, and just kind of talk to people passing by and introduce ourselves, um, which was a really big asset, because even for me it was kind of like this intangible, who's gonna, who's gonna support something that is totally, you know, uh, an idea still at this point. Um, and so that was one of the happiest surprises was just how many people really were willing to sort of prepay for a dinner or a breakfast or buy a t-shirt. Um, and um, we ended up reaching, you know, you never really know if this is going to be just a way of formalizing your pitch to your friends and family to say like, it's serious, we're really doing something, not just like hitting you up for money. Um, but probably about half, half of our um, donors um, were known to us, came from our email lists or people who had attended events of ours in the past, our pop-up events, friends, family, high school, <laughs> like friends. Um, but then half of them were people that we didn't know. Um, and so that was, we really attribute to a good amount of local press saying that, you know, these two young locals are doing this thing, um, but then also just meeting people as they walked by and um, we're your neighbors, we're happy to, happy to support. So um, that really was, you know, a way, we would never have been able to reach those people um, without making kind of a visual statement of what we were doing, I think. Yeah, the, the visual statement, uh, successful Kickstarters, for the most part, have, have good videos, high quality videos. So from when you said, we're going we're gonna to go with a Kickstarter project to when you press publish um, to go to day one of the project, how much prep work in terms of crafting the story and the narrative, um, writing that long spiel on the Kickstarter page to putting together a good two or three minute video. Was it weeks? Was it months? What was that time frame like? For us, it was pretty, that was, at that point, that was sort of our focus um, because until we had, until we had that money, we couldn't really sign on a contractor or do any of the other work involved. So we went, you know, full steam ahead. Um, I would say three weeks to prepare the campaign. Um, we had planned, so we had done a pop-up um, at Cuisine on Locale last summer um, where we sort of promoted the fact that we were doing a Kickstarter. We hosted a Kickstarter launch party um, and that was really fun. It gave people a reason to come out and, and see us and talk to us. Um, and we also did a closing party. So we had a little bit of that longer lead time planning of, okay, let's have an event to announce this. Um, and then the video we moved pretty quickly on. I produced the video. Um, so I wouldn't say it's particularly highbrow videography, um, but it was really more about, you know, sort of authenticity for us. Like we knew we weren't going to have uh, like big budget 
cinematography and that was fine. It was more showing people the space, telling a little bit of our story about um, pop-ups and you know, the influence of travel in our cuisine and the types of experiences we want to put together. Um, so we kept it fairly, you know, just simple. It's who we are. We're, neither of us are video people. Um, but we did realize that it was, it was important to have a video uh, more so than just photographs. Um, because, I mean, those statistics, I think, are pretty readily available that videos do better than other things. Um, and so, yeah, I would say three weeks to script and film and edit. Um, and we had, we had sort of put it out there to the public that we were going to do it. So, again, mm -hmm. like setting deadlines for yourself that other people will hold you to. Um, was important. Otherwise, I probably would have agonized over editing or like, you know, finding the right music. And that's just not, you don't have time for that at a certain point. So, um, yeah, three weeks for us. Yeah, so it, it was sort of a similar experience in a way. Um, so I'd done a lot of research, decided to go with Kickstarter, and then did a lot of research on top of that, watched a lot of other people's campaign videos, looked at a lot of pages, looked at your page, was one of the ones that I researched. Um, and so there was probably about a good month of just doing stuff like that. And then once we really were ready to go, it was about a month to do the whole video and write all the script and uh, put the page together and do all the photography and kind of get the general aesthetics of it together. Um, I don't know if anyone here saw the video, but ours ended up, I had the idea to do a lot of stop frame animation with fresh produce um, as kind of a way of pulling it together because I'm the same like you. I, I don't have any really video experience. I knew I couldn't do this high, high tier, really nice video, but I knew that I could probably do this stop frame animation thing and so put that together, uh, but it was extremely time consuming. Um, you know, all those photos, you know, you take over, over a thousand photos of, of produce and then my wife put it together using uh, iMovie. Um, so, but yeah, it was, it was about a month. Um, and same thing, I put it out there that I was going to do it to my email list, so it really holds you to it when you do that. And I think that's a good thing. Um, it gets people ready for it too, so that when it launches, they're, they've already thought about it some and are more willing to support you in it. Um, but yeah, that, that whole experience, and we did the, um, we, didn't, we didn't do a beginning party, but did a concluding party, and I feel like that was really a, a key part of the whole thing. Um, it was a couple days before the end, and it's, we ended up hitting the goal the day before, so it just really made it into a party, but it was a great way to pull everybody together, and kind of like you were saying, like, a lot of people from the community had had supported the project that I didn't know and so they came out to the concluding party so we were able to meet people from the neighborhood and really talk to them and uh, I think that was really really beneficial and, and something to consider if you're thinking about doing something like this. I went to the party and it was it was good beer and good times. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> I didn't have any of your produce at the time but I, yeah. just, I just drank beer. Yeah. But um, so you jumped ahead a little bit oh, to yeah. no it's fine it's fine so we'll backtrack to the creation of the campaign. Then there's pressing publish, and that is all about marketing, promo, gently spamming, spamming people, high school friends you haven't talked to in a while. So what, uh, what are the emotional, what's the emotions of, of like putting that live out in the world to the internet saying, support my dream or my business aspirations? Yeah, well, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's a feeling that you're really working towards, and so you're really looking forward to it. But for me, when I hit that, it was, it was kind of scary. It's actually sort of anticlimactic, because I spent an entire day sort of trying to get everything in place and do all the final editing and put all the rewards together, and, and then hit go. And then I didn't realize there was like another review process that had to occur. Um, so then another page comes up that's like, oh, submit for a review. So it's kind of anticlimactic. And then, um, so when I finally, so I waited till the next day. And then when I did that, I realized the review process was literally 10 minutes. It came back and it was ready to go. So it really wasn't any kind of big thing that I thought it was. Um, but, you know, within 
10 minutes of launching, I got the first contribution. And it wasn't anybody that I knew very well. It was someone I had piloted this concept at a Winter Hill Better Block Festival that was held back in December. And it was somebody who I'd met at that, at that festival. And so that feeling of launching and immediately getting someone from the community that's not even a family or friend that, that supports it, I think it was only like a $25 um, contribution, but it was huge. And uh, I always remember that feeling of, of seeing that come in and kind of just getting the, the feeling that, okay, this, this could work out, because you really don't know until you, until you put yourself out there. Um, and how whether so people, how much, what was your goal to raise, and as well as Katrina, what was your goal? Yeah, it was uh, 20,000, and we ended up uh, doing close to 22 in the end. Yeah, so um, our goal was 40,000, and we raised about $4,100, or 41,000 dollars. <laughs> um, we met our goal. Um, and the emotions were, I don't know, I think there's probably people who are totally happy and feel great about asking for money from people, but that's not an emotion that was um, natural to me. Um, so, but luckily I have, um, my partner Josh is so great at talking about what we're doing and not in a boastful kind of way, but just saying, this is what we're up to. We think it's pretty cool. We think you might like it. Um, and that's so critical. You can't be shy about doing this. If you believe in what you're doing, um, you, have to, you have to let other people know. Um, and so, a similar kind of experience when we, when we launched um, the campaign or the site, we had, you know, a, a good friend of ours, but a professional friend, um, donate, and then and then he started posting um, to his community saying these two people are doing this, you know, couldn't imagine any you know better people to do it, support them, um, and so we talk about this in the restaurant industry, um, but you know cultivating regulars and people who become your marketing team um, because they enjoy the product and that's the best. There's only so much that you can like talk about yourselves and be like, we're great, we love this sandwich. Um, that's only so important. Um, but then when you get people who have had the sandwich talking about, oh, we think it's great too. Um, that's, the, that's the way you can have exponential reach in your marketing efforts. And the same was true for Kickstarter. So we, um, you know, every, we added something to the signature line on our email that said, we're doing a Kickstarter campaign so that any person that we communicated with, even if the content of the correspondence wasn't about our project, they were able to look and see if they wanted to, um, which was kind of like a subtle way. We didn't have to, you know, spin every single moment of the day to be about Kickstarter, but subtly we were. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was ups and downs. We had our, like, okay, we're a quarter of the way through. We're not at a quarter funded, so should we be freaking out now? Should we be worrying? Um, and you start making contingency plans, and you're like, okay, well, is it, like, you know, is it kosher to, like, donate to your own campaign? Like, I know you're not supposed to do that, really, but if you're, if the option is leaving all the money on the table, like, are you going to, or are you going to call that, like, distant aunt to, like, you know, bankroll your campaign? Um, which I think is, it's good to have all those, in small business, it's good to have a backup plan. Um, because things don't always work out the way you intend them to. Um, sometimes because it's your fault, and sometimes unforeseen circumstances. So, um, I mean, being ready for that, anytime you put yourself out there, there's, there's a chance it won't be successful or you'll get, um, you won't get the response you're looking for. Um, but for the most part, it was a really positive and sort of reassuring way for us um, to be thinking about our business. Like, this is both of our first um, business of our own. Um, and so that kind of validation of like, oh, look, people are... People are on board. They're supporting us, um, you know. And again, meeting the people walking by, saying, "Okay, people like this idea. It must be a good idea." Um, we sort of thought of Kickstarter as 
a little bit of a test of the concept to say like, well, if no one, if no one besides our friends gives to it, then we're probably not going to have a lot of um, guests on day one because if our neighbors don't want us, then we're probably doing something wrong. So that was a little bit of like, okay, we put out there our our perfect scenario. People seem to like it. Great, we're going to go with that as opposed to like if no one had been in in um, interested or if we had really struggled to reach people, then that may have been a, um, a sign to us to kind of rethink where we were going. So, Both of your projects um, received a good amount of press. Um, did you have an, uh, a formal strategy for press outreach? I know you got Boston Magazine. I think that was yeah. kind of serendipitous. Yeah. Um, Eater Boston, I believe, cover maybe both of you. But yeah, how how did you approach the pre press? What was the the quick elevator pitch that you make it easy for them to tell your story? Yeah, um, for, for me, it kind of happened both ways. I I didn't have really a press plan uh, in line. Uh, the Boston Magazine thing just sort of happened. It happened right away. Uh, the day after I launched, a person from Boston Magazine who happened to live in uh, Union Square, and I'm actually still not sure how she saw it, but I saw the the video and, and saw the campaign and and contacted me to do an article, which was really huge, um, and really helped build the success. I feel like of of the campaign because you reach so many people that way, um, people who you're never going to reach through social media or through your email list or through your friend network, which is essentially what you're tapping into, um, and then some other stuff like Scout Somerville. Um, I have a friend who I hadn't realized that she worked for them, had contacted me a couple of months before I launched the Kickstarter and had kind of put me in contact with somebody there um, to do an article in the future. And then the Kickstarter launched and that person ended up getting in touch with me as well. So that, that really worked out. Um, and then Somerville Journal, that was another one that I, the reporter just, just came upon it and decided to do the article. Um, and then it was kind of interesting. Boston.com had contacted me. I did an interview, and then just the article never came out, um, which happens too. Um, I, there was already a few stories out there, and I think that it's what's newsworthy one day might not be the next. But I would say that if you do launch and, and the press does contact you, like they really need to move fast, so you really have to get back to them and do the interview as fast as possible, which is sometimes tricky when you're trying to get a small business because you have a lot of competing, competing people doing things. Um, and, but that was, for me, that was, that was a big thing was just being on top of it because that story has to come out the next day. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, for us, the, again, the fact that we had a physical space was big. Um, we weren't actually planning to announce anything about the restaurant or about anything, um, but we were outed. Um, some spies saw us scraping paint on the windows, and so there was like a teaser published, and so then we sort of like had to think, okay, well, we're certainly not going to be open for at least five months, um, pro and it turned out to be nine months. Um, <laughs> so we were thinking like, okay, how do we how do we sort of drop lines here and there that keep keep the project um, relevant to the to the press and to people who are curious? Um, and so we're lucky to have um, you know good relationships with a lot of the media outlets um, through our pop up events, and you know they're on our listserv. So when we announce things, they know the, um, they know about it. And um, again, kind of thinking about think about what story they would, would write and, and tailor that message. Like, you know, local couple uh, opens restaurant, like doing Kickstarter campaign, not super, I don't know, attention grabbing, um, but as much work as you can do to say, okay, well, what is the story here? Um, and so for us, it was sort of like pop up to brick and mortar, like that's an interesting narrative that I think a lot of people are trying out now. Um, but there's a lot of you know question to that, and how does it work, and you know what are you up to, um, and also the fact that you know we were 
we were and are interested in creating a community space. And so having the funding strategy reflect the vision of the of the restaurant made it a made it a relevant and kind of like appropriate narrative for for media coverage. Um, and then also having those events, like we could invite them, hey, come come to our event. We'll be, um, you know, we'll be cooking and try our food, and this will be a little teaser of what you'll what you'll have at Juliet. Um, so, you know, thinking about what would make the story newsworthy, um, and as much as you can curating that, because. It takes a lot more work, I think, to get just noticed for something. But if you can feed the, like, oh, we think this would be a great addition to your, you know, coming soon post or your, you know, in the, our campaign wraps on May 15th, like, your, you know, June issue, like, is kind of too late for us to be relevant. Um, so, like you said, timing and, and making sure you have those things kind of ready. Um, and creating those contacts, you know, it's easier to create contacts when you're not asking for something. Um, so if, if this is something that's kind of a seed in your head, like start talking to people and, and meet some of the, we have a ton of local um, like Union Square and Somerville residents um, who are part of the media community. Um, and you probably, you probably know them if you don't know that they're, um, even if you don't know their affiliations. So. Um, yeah, create that, creating that personal relationship, I think, makes, makes all that easier. You know, you're not throwing something against a brick wall, you're having a conversation with a person, so. Um, last question before we open it up to the audience. Um, Two-part question. Um, what lessons for anyone out in the audience or watching at home? Uh, lessons for someone that wants to do their first pop-up, because you guys seem pretty well versed in that and uh, want to launch a Kickstarter project. Uh, you said talk to people. A little, little easier said than done. So what, uh, what's like the first thing that, that people could do? Well, for us, I mean, we, our pop-up history kind of happened really organically. Um, just Josh and I both like food and people and we hosted an event. Um, Actually, well, I guess less organically now that I remember. Um, Kinfolk, Where was that event? Um, on Eva's Garden in South Dartmouth. Um, Kinfolk Magazine approached Josh to be part of um, a dinner series that would happen across the country on, on May Day, and it was a flower potluck. Um, and so we were kind of like, okay, that sounds fun. Like, we both have full-time jobs. We weren't at all planning to have a restaurant at that point. Um, in any active kind of way. And so that was a fun opportunity that we took advantage of. And then the guests of that event, we stayed in touch with. So you get, you know, you get access to a few people who don't know you otherwise um, and keep in touch with them. So making sure we had an email list and, and even if we didn't have anything, you know, groundbreaking to talk about, we kept that. Um, messaging sort of alive. And then, um, you know, we started by thinking about things that were fun and interesting to us. Um, one of Josh's favorite foods is corn. And so we thought, let's have a corn dinner. Um, or one of our first sort of independent pop-ups was a Texas barbecue event, because I grew up in Texas. Um, and so doing things that are fun for us and seeing what the response is to people. Um, None of those events would, would have been possible without partners. Um, so, you know, a friend with an art gallery invited us to her space. Um, a farmer said, come out to the farm, host an event. Um, you know, we did a breakfast taco pop-up at Kitchen Inc. Three, three years ago now, and that was one of the most successful um, pop-ups we ever, we ever did, and that was sort of like proof of concept, because I thought, well, Boston needs to know about breakfast tacos. No one else does that. Um, and it proved true. Like, we had a line of 150 people and had no idea they were coming. Um, and so that gives you a way, I guess I'm not really describing how to do a pop-up, but in the way you're conceiving of them, like, we went from the varied theme route rather than we are the 
barbecue pop-up and we will do 50 barbecue events. Um, for us, that didn't make sense because we weren't sure if there was one type of cuisine or one type of event that we wanted to have consistently. We wanted an outlet to explore a lot of things. And that gave us insight into, okay, Union Square loves breakfast tacos. Um, so now we have them on the menu every day. Um, and so you can learn those things without the overhead and all that kind of stuff. Um, but partnership is the only way that those can be successful because you don't have things like a space or um, you know, even access to a population of people coming by every day. Um, so thinking about who some of the community partners are that either have, you know, like we're in a great space um, and what kind of event makes sense here because that sort of determines the overall success of your event is, um, you know, alignment of concept with the space and the parameters um, because pop-ups are really, really hard. Um, they're financially sometimes easier than building a restaurant, um, but they're really difficult. You have to bring everything in, take it all away, market this one event really, really hard and hope that people come. Um, and then if you have the persistence to do it again, it'll be a little bit easier the next time, um, but it's always hard. So. It's sort of a good test of you know, what you like to do, but also it gives you a sense of the different kind of spaces that you uh, might want to operate in neighborhoods or specific like physical spaces. Um, that was a long, a long spiel about pop-ups. <laughs> um, for Kickstarters. We may have t we, we touched I'm on gonna that pass a good on amount. That <laughs> um, and I'm going to second a lot of the things there. Um, I think one difference is I I did a small pilot of a pop-up at the uh, Winter Hill Better Block Festival, but it was really just a demonstration. I didn't sell very much produce. I really just talked to the community and, and got people on board. Um, but this weekend I have my first sort of real pop-ups, and they're going to go through out the month of August. Um, and it's it's difficult. <laughs> you know, it's a ton it's a ton of planning preparation. Um, you know, I was up at four this morning going to Chelsea Produce Market, and uh, I've been doing that all week because a lot of that is relationship building, making sure they see your face, and uh, and relying on on people that you know for for help with different things. Um, if you need cold storage, if you need the space, uh, the Winter Hill Brewery has been has been very very helpful throughout this entire process, and I think that goes back to you saying you know make those contacts early on. Um, the Winter Hill Brewery is really, it's open right be behind where I live. And so I went during their community meeting that they had sort of early on in the process before the building was built out or anything, just in their empty building, and kind of talked to them about this concept then. Um, a good, that was actually a, a really a, a, over a year ago now. Um, and so that really helps it, helps it get going. Um, but I think the benefit of doing a pop-up is you're able to sort of get some of those logistical problems that might be there, at least for me. There's a, a lot, because you're sourcing produce from local farms. Um, you know, I drove out to Stowe and back yesterday. Um, and it gives you a chance to really figure out how all the operations are gonna work, and then also the customers, um, the people in the community who, who are gonna be interested. You, know, you get to start out with something that's, that's simple and you kind of are able to build on it and uh, and actually find out what people want rather than just opening up a store and just hoping that people come in. Um, when you do actually open up the storefront, you already have customers, you already sort of know what they're looking for and you're able to then build out something that's more for them. Um, and then for the second part of the question was just Kickstarter. We, we hit on advice. Kickstarter pretty yeah. good. We, be, we beat that, yeah. that horse thing. to death. Real, real quick, we left a seat. Our third panelist was supposed to be Jeff Rowe from Winter Hill Brewing. They used GoFundMe um, for their crowdfunding, but they got too busy, and he's a small business owner, and he, he couldn't make it, but we, you know, mad love to Jeff. So what were you going to say? So my, the connection between pop-ups and crowdfunding is um, if you don't have a space or a physical anything, if you don't have something to show people, um, 
doing a pop-up or even just a little, you know, standing somewhere and talking to people gives that sort of proof of concept there. Like, I'm doing a Kickstarter about these vegetables that are in front of me. Um, and I think that's, you know, people who came to our events when are you opening a restaurant? Do you have a physical space? We did lots of events and that were with other restaurants, and we were like, well, we don't really have a restaurant yet, but we're working on it. Um, and so reaching those people who would eventually be interested, um, I think, is, is critical to the success of whatever crowdfunding platform you choose to do. Um, and you never know who one of those, if one of those people is going to be I'm a, you know, I'm an investor. Like, I'm interested in the type of business you're talking about. Um, so, that's the... It's a, it's a grown-up lemonade stand. Exactly. There yeah. we go. Everyone can relate to that. Um, questions from the audience. What do, we, what do we got, guys? Who wants to, who wants to know more? Here we go. Yeah, so for us, um, we did, we looked at other restaurants and looked kind of, okay, what are they offering? Um, and some of it was fairly easy for us to come up with. Um, things like, you know, breakfast, breakfast on us, dinner on us. Um, and for those, it's really, you know, think about, loosely think about the cost of providing that service, which is probably going to be nominal against um, the donation and then you know you bulk it up because the person's doing it because they're interested in you um, it's not face value like if we're selling a sandwich for five dollars we wouldn't offer the Kickstarter reward for five dollars so um, we wanted to have um, plenty of those types of once we're open come in and redeem this um, but then we also wanted to reach people who were not local um, so you know, we can't offer you a class because you may never come to Massachusetts, but you are interested in us or you know us. So we did um, spice boxes, um, t-shirts. I have an, a line of aprons, so I made custom aprons for people. Um, and so having that diversity, too, of some things are $10 because it's important to let everyone engage, even if, it's, even if you don't have a, a lot of money to contribute. Um, and that diversity of... Do you have to physically be here to redeem it? Or is this something that, you know, you'll wear your t-shirt and, and you get to talk about it. Like, I helped this, this business get off the ground. Um, so that was, we thought about mostly the geographic um, piece of it, making sure that there's, there's things for people far away. Um, and then sort of comparing, you know, for some of our experiences, we looked at like, well, what would you pay for a prefix dinner somewhere and made that sort of the guide for pricing um, knowing that it's sort of okay if y the idea isn't to like make money on the rewards it's to have people pay in advance for something that they would spend that money on anyway um, and so we looked at you know other restaurants in town or other Kickstarter rewards and see how successful they were because it shows on Kickstarter anyway you can put a limited number of something um, so we did you know dinner for 10 in your house like catered by us um, and we only put a few of those available knowing that that would be a big labor output for us to do that but that's a big ticket item so if someone wants to um, you know pay a few thousand dollars for a party will certainly make it happen, um, but you don't want to get into a situation of overextending just to fulfill the rewards. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a good question. I um, spent a lot of time researching and thinking about the rewards before, before I launched, and, um, and so, you know, you, re you really want to, kind of like what you were saying, have something that speaks to what the business is. So I started out with a lot of things of just the reusable grocery bag and, and, and items like that, which, which are related, um, and then ended up extending it out to actual produce, so um, a, a certain amount of produce a, a month type thing, and tried to gear it towards certain uh, amounts. Um, 
So there's, there's a lot of data out there about what levels people will generally support at. Um, 25, 50, and 100 are really the, the top ones that the majority of the people who are, will pledge will go for those rewards. So I thought it was a good idea to make those levels a little bit more appealing than some of the other ones. Um, like, you know, not too many people will go for 250 for whatever reason, um, or 75. It's kind of a funny thing, um, some of the numbers in between. Um, one thing that I think speaking to making sure, like looking at the cost versus what the reward is, it's, it's an interesting balance because you're not just getting the money, you're trying to provide something. At the same time, it has to be something that won't kill you in the end trying to fulfill that reward. Um, I sometimes now, looking back, think I was probably a little bit too generous with some levels. Um, probably offered up too much produce that going down the road, logistically even, it's gonna, it might be difficult. And I'm, I'm kind of working through that now and figuring it out. Um, so one thing to know, I, I don't know about the other platforms, how those work. With Kickstarter, once you put a reward up there and someone chooses it, you can't take it down or edit it or change it. So realizing that maybe I had made an error in the Kickstarter, there's nothing you can do about it. So it's just something to really look at when you're, when you're planning it and really look at those costs of the rewards versus the total amount that you're trying to raise and make sure it balanced. But I, I don't think I overextended it too because bringing in people to, to get produce and, and providing that to them, it, it's a good thing for the store itself. So you know, you bring people into the store, there's a certain amount of produce that's free and then, and then you create a shopping base. So I think you have to think about that too. Um, and one thing that we didn't really touch on that I think is really a, a benefit of Kickstarter, actually we, we did talk about it a little bit, it's just, it's a really great way to engage the community. even like. In some ways, even if you don't make goal or even if you set the goal kind of small, the benefits of being able to tap into all these people that maybe you, you don't even you don't know, but they're living in the community or interested in what you're doing, you know, it's it's huge. And it's a list that you can go back to and you know, have all those people on your email list and let them know what's going on with the with the project and you just instantly are able to to connect in a way that a business that's just getting funding from a bank um, wouldn't be able to engage the community in that same way. And I think that's, that's really, at the end of the day, the real power of crowdfunding, especially when it's geared towards a community and not like a technology product that's going to be shipped out or something like that. Excellent. Um, where can people find you physically, brick and mortar, uh, or pop-up, and as well as online and, and on social media? Um, well, physically, for the pop-up, we'll be at the Winter Hill Brewery um, every Saturday and Sunday through the month of August. Where's um, that again for? for yeah, everyone? yeah, it's at 328 Broadway. Um, so, kind of just going up Broadway from from East Somerville, and uh, it's a neat building. It was an old cell phone store that the brewery guys turned into this this nice brewery and restaurant. Um, online, uh, nbrhoodproduce.com. Uh, I'm on Facebook as well, and uh, Instagram account. No Twitter yet, so we'll see. We got enough going on. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you can find us just around the corner seven days a week at uh, 257 Washington Street. And the breakfast tacos are <laughs> on point. But you have to get there early because we, we do the barbecue style service of those, which is uh, they go out at 7 a.m. and we have them until they're gone. So. Thanks, guys.